I want to thank you for downloading or streaming this message from Victory. We believe that the starting point for real life change is centered around God's word lived out with God's people. So no matter who you are or where you are or what you're struggling with, our goal is to inspire and equip you with a new perspective that will give you a better way to do life. And we pray that as you live out God's word, you will truly experience something more, something better. And if you haven't experienced a live Victory service yet, we invite you to visit victorycc.life for more information on when and where you can join us. No matter where you are in the world, you can tune in with us through Victory Everywhere. That's what we're calling our online campus, Victory Everywhere. Or if you're local, we'd love to have you join us here in person. Here at Victory, we're contributors, not just consumers, and we consider it a privilege to give back what God has so freely given us. We celebrate generosity and the work that God does with our sacrificial giving and in our community and around the world. Now, if the message that you are about to hear helps you, inspires you, and challenges you in any way, we invite you to partner with us financially in our vision of connecting people back to God. Join us by going to victorycc.life slash gift. Thank you again for watching. We hope you enjoy this message. You know, pain is a lonesome place. I don't have to tell you, do I? It'll drop a rock in your stomach right through your pounding heart. And when your knees are so weak, you hit the ground and you finally realize you don't got this. Well, now you might just make it. You see, the tallest tree may not weather the storm, but its roots do. So dig in, stand up, and let the wind blow. Because there's hope. Growing up, I had a summer job that I kept all through high school and college. Every summer, I was a cart boy for a country club in my hometown. I worked for, around the golf course. In order to close, in order to go home every night and leave work, we had to make sure that all 75 golf carts were cleaned and returned back to the cart barn. That was one of the closing jobs, can't leave until it's done. I remember being short-staffed one night. It was just me and my one friend, Gary, who is still one of my closest buddies, in, in the world still today. Well, Gary and I were swamped that night. Uh, there was a major event going on and all the golf car, uh, carts were out on the course. Nobody brought them back. They all, there was a live band or something playing at the patio. So nobody did what they were supposed to do. So we had to, for every golf cart, run back up to the patio uphill about a hundred yards. We had to get the golf cart, bring it back down, clean it, restock it, plug it in, repeat over and over and over again in, in the summer, 75 times. And I forget what we had plan for that night as high school students in Kentucky. I, I can tell you it was probably riveting what we had going on. <laughs> but we had places to be. We, we were impatient. We were ready to get out of there, ready to leave work. So finally, my buddy Gary gets this great idea. I know how to get us out of here faster. And so he lines up two golf carts next to each other and sort of spreads out and grabs one steering wheel with each hand, one foot on each gas pedal, and drives two golf carts at the same time. And you're probably thinking, that couldn't have ended well. And you'd be right. <laughs> it didn't. Uh, Gary lost control. He was taking the golf carts together down this hill, and one of them just left. And it shot off like a rocket. It was flying down the hill, and there was no way it was going to stop unless, until it hit something. So I, I look at kind of what's going down the barrel at this high speed, and it's, it's the starter's bench. So picture this wrought iron black bench that's sitting there by the first tee box. It's bolted into the ground. This runaway golf cart absolutely smashes it, just straight through it. The thing comes up out of the grass. It lifts it up out. It looked like a tornado had come through right in that spot. And it sounded like a full-on interstate collision, this, this golf cart into this, into this bench. Of course, we look at each other. The first thing we do as high school students is, did anybody see that? Did anybody hear that? And we look over at the putting green, and of course, there's one guy, old man, Mr. Crawford, was sitting there putting. It was getting a little dark, and he was kind of starting to putt under the lights. We knew, Gary and I knew, that his hearing wasn't the best just from interacting with him. But a bomb just went off right behind him, and the guy did not flinch. <laughs> and we were so thankful for Mr. Crawford. 
The starter's bench was mangled. We went and picked it up out of the grass. It was a mess. We sort of set it back where it belonged. We cleaned up real fast and we left. We got out of there that night. Problem was, we had to open the next morning. So we come back uh, to, to the golf club and we were not the first ones there. Two police officers and the golf course superintendent were standing there at the scene looking at it and we walked up very timidly and they looked at the scene, they looked at us and the first person to speak was the golf course superintendent and he's after thinking for a minute, he looked at Gary and me and he said, I know it was those neighborhood kids again. <laughs> to which Gary said, had to be. It had to be. Had to be. <laughs> I know you were looking for that part in the story where the future pastor, you know, stood up and said, I'm going to own up for our crime and our impatience. But if I told you the story that way, it wouldn't be truthful. <laughs> and that was before I knew Christ. So... We're going to be talking a little bit about, about patience today. We're in week two of our series, Hope in the Dark. This is a study of the book of Habakkuk. We've taken three weeks to look at this three-chapter book, one chapter each Sunday. In chapter one, last week, uh, Habakkuk the prophet asked God a question, a very raw and emotional question he brought to God. God, with all the suffering going on in the world, when you look around at all the destruction, all the debauchery, all the injustice, God, where are you in this? Do you even see this, God? Do you even care? Habakkuk wrestled with God. And Josh reminded us last Sunday that God responded to Habakkuk's question. In your wildest dreams, Habakkuk, God said, you're not going to believe what I'm going to do. You will be amazed what I'm going to do in the land of Judah. I'm going to address all the evil you're talking about, and I'm going to use your biggest enemies. I'm going to use the Babylonians to do it. And God was right. Habakkuk was amazed. Habakkuk was appalled, actually. He was, he was disturbed that God would use Babylon, the worst of the worst. They were ruthless, murderous people. They defied God and God's people. How could God use them? So we came to Habakkuk's second question. He said, God, why would you use the Babylonians? How could you use a people even more wicked than us to set this thing straight? And here's where we pick up for today's message. Habakkuk chapter 2. After the prophets complain about Babylon, here's what he does. It says, I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts, on the towers. I'll look to see what he will say to me and what answer I'm going to give to this complaint. Some of us learned last Sunday for the very first time that it's okay to wrestle with God. I would say it's not even just okay that God wants us to bring our frustrations and our questions to him. That's, that's what we see. And if you thought God was some kind of impersonal creator that doesn't listen to his creation, that's, that's not what we see anywhere. God's nature is both a just ruler and also a tender, loving father. So we should wrestle with God and take our frustrations to him. But here's something that you cannot miss in that. It's what Habakkuk does immediately after he voices his frustrations. Chapter one, he pours out all his complaints. God, how could you do this? How could you use Babylon to do this? And then Habakkuk says, okay, I'm going to stand and watch. I'm not going to abandon my post. I don't like it at all, God. I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense to me, but God, now I'm going to listen. I have voiced my opinion and now I'm going to listen. This isn't easy to do when you're hurting, right? Because when you're suffering, when you're waiting for God in that way, you just want to tell God how, what to do, how to do it, when to do it, don't we? God, just heal my family member. You can do it, God. Just take away the pain. God, just get them pregnant. Come on, they'd be great parents, God. God, please remove this pain from me. And God, if you do, you know we're going to give you all the glory. You know we'll praise you for that, God. But if you don't do it, well, how, how am I supposed to defend you? That's how we feel sometimes when we come to God with this. We, he, but Habakkuk, he handles it differently. He pours out his frustrations to him, and then he waits. He listens. I, he doesn't abandon his post. Chapter 1 in Habakkuk was about wondering, God, where are you in this? Do you see what's going on here, God? And chapter 2 is about waiting. Is, is about waiting for God to respond. Well, he does respond to Habakkuk, and here's what God says. Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time, a perfect time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and it will not delay. God's 
message to Habakkuk, his message to every one of us, I believe, who are experiencing some level of unrest, which I would propose is probably all of us to some degree, his message is to wait. He's saying, though it linger, wait for it. It'll come. It will not delay. It'll come at just the exact time that it should. Though it linger, wait. Waiting on the Lord. We sing about it. We sing about it this morning. Waymaker, you've heard it preached before. I know you have. But how? Practically speaking, how are we supposed to actually wait on God through our circumstances? What does that actually look like? What does it require? Well, it requires tremendous patience. Last Sunday night, I had the privilege of teaching up in the high school gathering. And right now they're in the series. I believe today is probably their last day. They're talking about the fruits of the Spirit, I think in middle school too. So they've been looking at our students this one verse. They've been going over and over in in Galatians. The verse is, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. This is the verse that the students have been looking at. And Zach our student minister, he asked them, okay, hey, now that you know the fruits of the Spirit, now that you know them, which one's the most difficult for you? When you're looking at these, which one's the hardest? And what do you think it was? The most responses that I saw by far were patience. And if you got kids in that area, you're like, yeah, that checks out. Yeah. (laughs) But it doesn't matter. Middle school, high school, if you went to school, if you walked to school uphill both ways in the snow, doesn't matter how old you are, patience is hard. It's just, it's difficult. In uh, a study by the Journal of Positive Psychology, they define patience this way. They say patience is the propensity to wait calmly, to wait calmly in the face of frustration or adversity. I told my wife that I was talking about patience today. She said, oh, oh, really? You're talking about patience? That's interesting. She said, I can't wait to come to your cooking class. Well, let, me, let me know when that happens. <laughs> it's the word calmly for me when I look at this. The word calmly jumps out to me. I can wait sometimes if I absolutely have to. But man, other times I look like a kid with ants in my pants when I'm trying to wait. And that's not quite patience. It says here to wait calmly, to not freak out, to not lose your wits in the middle of the waiting. And I think one thing we get wrong about patience is that it feels passive. It feels kind of weak, Right? So when I'm faced with this frustration or adversity, you're saying to me that just wait, just, just don't do anything. That feels, that feels kind of wimpy to me when I look at that. Isn't that the cowardly way to just not do anything, to just let it play out? That's, that's how I honestly thought about patience at first. But wow, when I looked at it, I couldn't have been more wrong. Patience is the ultimate power move. Patience is a tremendous flex of the will. Check this out. This is in Psalm 27, wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart, wait for the Lord. That's not passive language at all. Be strong. In Proverbs 16, better a patient person than a warrior, one with self-control than one who takes the city. This, I don't see passivity at all in patience, the opposite. Patience takes tremendous strength. When God asks us to be patient, he's asking us to be bold. He's asking us to be co- courageous, to do something wild. When things aren't going the way that you really want them to, to resolve to be patient is strong. So how do we wait on the Lord? Well, we have to have strength and patience. But what else? What does that really look like? I was walking my son into preschool this week, and he had an epic meltdown, as kids do. He's got this big sheet of superhero stickers. So my house is covered in Superman, Spider-Man, Green Lantern, just all over my house. So we're walking. We're almost to his classroom. We're down the hallway. And I stopped, and in this exact tone, I said to him, hey, buddy, it's time to put the stickers away, just like that. And he lost it. It was a, it was a five-alarm fire, <laughs> tears and wailing and cries, yeah? What, what, I'm, what I'm about to say to you, what I'm about to say is something that I, I looked back. I shared this five years ago, and so I feel like I'm good to, to share it again. But somebody gave me tremendous advice. A mother of three told me this once. She said, hey, when your toddler's losing it, when your kid is screaming at the top of his lungs, having an epic meltdown, because you took away a toy or you told him no or something, he's acting like that. She's acting like that because it's the worst thing that's ever happened to him. It really is. You've got to remember that. There's nothing worse. It, it's truly the worst thing that's happened. He's reacting like that because he can't fathom, he can't compute anything worse. This is his deepest valley that he's experienced to this point. In his world, this is the worst experience. He's four years old. 
He's not thinking about inflation or his career or the salvation of his friends. That's never crossed his mind. He's never once considered his mortality or the IRS or the depletion of the ozone. It's not, when you're four, all you care about is what, your family, your toys, what you're going to eat. And when you're denied some opportunity like that, it's the end of the world. He cannot compute anything worse. There's nothing to categorize it. It doesn't add up why his dad, who he knows loves him, who he knows loves him, would not let this happen. He doesn't, how could his dad tell him no? And as his dad, of course, my heart breaks for him. That's my best buddy. But I can see, right? My view is different. I can see the whole picture. And I want to say to him, son, if you only knew, look, I know this is the most devastating thing that you've experienced. If you could trust me, though, if you could just see from my vantage point, you could tell that everything is going to be fine. So what if? What if the worst days in our adult lives, the most traumatic, horrific experiences, our biggest seasons of breakdown, when we're totally justified at the time to be at the end of our rope in the biggest, darkest seasons of pain, what if in those valleys, God empathizes with us in our pain, but he also at the same time sees a different perspective, sees the bigger picture that we can't understand. What if that's the case? So Paul, the guy who knew this more than anybody in the New Testament, we're talking about the man God used to write so much of the New Testament, to grow the church exponentially in the ancient Near East. That guy, Paul, is begging God, please take this thorn away from me. We don't know what it is. We think it was something physical that he had to deal with every day when he woke up, something that just terrorized him. And he's asking, God, please help remove this from me. I know you can take it away. Please, God, do it. And what does God say? He says, no, I won't. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. So I want to hear what this guy Paul says when he's talking about being patient in our sufferings. Check this out, what Paul says in Romans. He says, I consider, and the Greek word here is I compute, or when I add everything up, our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Not that the glory revealed in us will be way bigger, but it doesn't even compare. They're not even in the same page. They're different galaxies here, Paul's saying. For the creation waits, though it linger, the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, to adversity, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that The creation itself would be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory the children of God. God's perspective, his view is so much bigger. His perspective is complete. You and I, we're walking around with thinking about what's ahead for the day, what's ahead for the next week. Maybe sometimes we're thinking about years ahead, but I think this phrase bondage to decay, it really is so huge because Our view is so tiny, so minuscule, so finite. Everything we see and know, and I know this is grim, but everything we're around, everything around us, life is fading. It's moving toward death. So no wonder we're thinking, God, it's hard to be patient when everything around us is chained to finitude, God. But God sees it all. He sees everything from a way bigger perspective. And he says, no, you don't see the whole picture yet. You have to trust. I I know this is the worst thing you've ever experienced. God says, but I'm going to be with you through it. And I believe he says, my son, my daughter, if only you knew, if only you could see the whole picture, if only you could see everything the way I see it, you would know everything's going to be set right. You would know that when we add it up at the end of the day, when we compute everything, that this is going to be nothing worth comparing to the freedom and the glory that awaits. Habakkuk teaches us to wait on the Lord. And that means to exercise great patience And it means also to grow our perspective. And I mentioned God's empathy. That's not just some throwaway side note part. God truly sits with us in our pain. He doesn't just acknowledge it. Hey, I see what's going on. He he walks in it with us. We have a God who knows heartache intimately. He's no stranger to it. So when we're hurting, God is there with us in our waiting. Much of Habakkuk 2 is God doing just that. What's Habakkuk's biggest complaint? God, how are you going to use Babylon? Why would you use this evil people? They're the worst nation in the world. God, they take prisoners, they worship idols, have, they treat their slaves like animals. Come on, God, don't just ignore this. And God doesn't. He's a just God. He does give them their justice. They will meet it, just not yet. It comes on God's appointed time. And we're almost to the most famous verse in Habakkuk, the one in, people refer to as the great text. 
So here it is. See, the enemy is puffed up. And that Hebrew word means swollen or bigger than it usually is. The enemy is large right now. His desires are not upright. But the righteous, here it is, the righteous person will live by his faith. The righteous will live by faith. Though it linger, the righteous will live by faith. Through the suffering, the righteous will live by faith. Through the waiting, the righteous will live by faith. Even when we can't see him working, the righteous will live by faith. Even when it doesn't make sense to us, this pain, this season, and it's hard to hold out hope, even in those times, the righteous will live by faith. Something you've likely heard us say here at Victory before is the opposite of faith is, is not doubt. The opposite of faith is sight. The opposite of faith is sight. Did, did Habakkuk have doubt? Sure seems like it to me. Remember how he questioned God? God, do you even see this? Where are you through this? He questioned God. You're going to use the Babylonians. But through that, Habakkuk never stopped believing that God was God. He never stopped serving him. He never abandoned his post. The opposite of faith is not doubt, it's sight. Habakkuk couldn't see a way with his own eyes, with his own very limited perspective. But in it, he trusted that God knew what he was doing and that God was God. He was on his throne and he knew at the perfect time, at just the right time, that God would act for his good and for his glory. In the year, in the year 1990 in Miami, Florida, two men entered an apartment complex with intentions to rob and in the scrum, they fatally shot one man. So tipsters around there, they reported to the police that the assailants, one of the assailants' names was Tommy James. And when police brought in a local man with that name, he was convicted of first-degree murder and armed robbery. So 23-year-old Thomas Raynard James was sentenced to life in prison. This was devastating for James and his family because they knew he was innocent. They knew it. He'd never been to this apartment complex before. He wasn't a robber or a murderer. For years, he and his lawyers fought this case while he was incarcerated. His mother spent every waking hour canvassing the neighborhood, knocking on doors, trying to find some evidence that would prove her son's innocence. Well, it was finally discovered that the real Tommy James they were looking for had fled the state. He ended up passing away in Nevada years later. So the spring of 2022, this year, just a few months ago, some 32 years later, a Miami judge approved a motion by prosecutors to vacate Mr. James' conviction and sentence. Thomas James was finally found free. He was made free man and found innocent. And after spending over 30 years, more than half of his life behind bars for a crime that he did not commit. So when the now 55-year-old James was interviewed in April, they asked him, hey, it's well known that all those years, you were constantly telling the guards, you were always telling the other inmates that you were innocent. You wouldn't stop talking about it. So, Mr. James, tell us, how did you keep the faith that you would someday get out? What was your secret? And, and Thomas Rayner James said this, if you had ears, I told it to you. I wasn't going to stop until I was either free or dead, is what James said. It's so profound. I'll say that again. Locked up when he was 23 not seen the light of day until he was 55 years old as a free man. And how did he keep the faith? He told everybody who would listen, and he did not stop until he was either free or dead. So I don't know what it is in your life that you're waiting on. I believe we all have something that we're waiting on, that we've been praying, God, take this away from me. God, take this away from them. God, please make this happen. Whatever it is, God, you got the wrong guy. God, you got the wrong girl. What do I do to deserve this kind of suffering? Is it an illness that's been plaguing you or a loved one or maybe it's an addiction, some problem at home or work or some problem in your marriage, some area of your life where there is no peace, where you feel imprisoned? And we should pray incessantly to God. How many times have we seen people delivered, seen people healed and freed from this? So many times. It happens all the time. God answers our prayers. But also sometimes for reasons that we can't see, God doesn't take it away. Sometimes he doesn't. And in those seasons of waiting, what if we resolve to say, God, I'm not going to stop giving you praise. Every person with ears, God, is going to hear it from me that I still have faith. God, every person who can hear is going to hear about you from me. And God, I'm not going to stop until you either free me or until I'm dead. 
God, I'm not going to stop until you either deliver me from this or until we meet face to face, God. I will not stop. I will not stop believing in you because I know you have a plan and I know you're good and I know your perspective is greater. What if we had a faith like that? The prophet Habakkuk says, the righteous will live by faith. The righteous will live by faith. Well, you know what about faith is faith in God includes faith in God's timing. Faith in God includes faith also in his timing. It's not just believing in God that exists. It's believing that he exists, he loves you, and his timing is perfect, and he will not delay. Baby dedication is such a happy day. I I love watching that this morning in both services. I love it. Sometimes I think maybe I should rededicate my kids. <laughs> Sometimes they probably think oh, we should dedicate our dad. But it's a great reminder. Here's why I love it, because it's a great reminder to all parents. What you're saying when you dedicate your son or your daughter, what these parents are saying is, God, I don't know what you have in store for her. I don't know what you have in store for her, him. But she's yours, God. But he's yours. I don't know what, what this, his or her life is going to look like. But God... They're yours. We're going to raise them for you. And you know, the thing about raising kids, whether you got infant kids or your kids are grown, is there are seasons of waiting, right? Seasons of waiting where you're just like, God, please take this away from my child. Please make this happen for my child, God. Seasons of waiting. So when you're dedicating your child, what you're not just saying is, God, we have faith in you, is that God have faith in your timing for him or for her. To say that, God, I know you're going to work together all things for their good, and it'll be on your time, even when it doesn't make sense to me, their earthly parent. Yeah, that's a big declaration. That is a weighty thing to do right there. Though it linger, wait for it. Though it linger, wait. The righteous will live by faith. God will make all things right, but it'll be in his time, in his own way. So the majority of chapter 2 in Habakkuk then is God calling out the Babylonian sins. He's outlining everything that will come to pass in that evil nation. Scholars refer to this part as the five woes, the five woes. They have to do with exploitative economic practices, you know, treating people like slaves, corrupt, bloodthirsty leaders, sexual sin, all kinds of stuff. But I want to call out just the one. I want to call out specific attention to the fifth woe that God pronounces against Babylon because I think it underpins all the rest of it. I think this last violation against God is the biggest one. So check this out. The fifth woe. Of what value is an idol carved by a craftsman or an image that teaches lies? For the one who makes it trusts in his own creation. He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood, come to life or to lifeless stone. Wake up. Can it give guidance? It's covered with gold and silver. There is no breath in it, says God. Babylon like so many other ancient nations, made their own gods. They would fashion them out of raw materials, and they worshiped them. They worshiped idols. And when you worship an idol, the thing about it is it it requires you to do something. It's just a piece of wood or stone. So you've got to do something to get positive outcomes, whether you make sacrifices to it, present offerings, whether you would kill for it, you would sing chants or do some kind of thing that would elicit some kind of response. You're manipulating the idol that you created. And so what you ultimately end up doing in that is worshiping yourself. You end up making yourself a God when you have idols. And I love this contrast here in the final words, in the final verses, final verse in chapter two of Habakkuk. Okay, though it linger, wait. God can see all their evil. He knows every detail of it. And after God points to their silly little idols that they have in Babylon that they've made, God says this in contrast. He says, the Lord though, is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Don't worry, Habakkuk. They're little idols of wood and stone. They're going to fade away faster than you can imagine. They're lifeless creations. There's no breath in it. But your God, he is the creator. He's very much alive and he reigns in his holy temple, not subject to decay or manipulation. The one true God, he's got plans for you. And what's he asking his creation to do? Be silent. Listen. Though it linger, wait for it. Wait for it. And I've never met anyone who truly enjoys waiting. Right? Waiting is hard. I don't know anybody who really likes seasons 
of waiting. But something happens to us when we wait for the Lord. Something happens in us, something we don't have access to in any other way. We get something from God in those seasons of waiting that we can't get any other way. It's a, it's a piece of him that we only get when we're fully and completely void of control, when there is nothing we can do to change or manipulate the outcome. Only in those seasons, we get a different side of God. When there's something else you can't do and you have total dependence on him. It's an authentic faith that we get in seasons of waiting. See, trusting in God means trusting in his timing. Even in our suffering, even when it doesn't make sense, even when the pain is great, even when we've been battling this for a long time, even when our perspective is so small, even when we don't know if we can even see him working, we have to trust that he is, though it linger, wait. The righteous will live by faith, says the great prophet. Though it linger, wait. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your presence in all seasons. God, you're the God of the mountaintop and you are the God of the valley when we're waiting. God, all of us, there's something in our hearts right now that we are waiting for. Some way that we want you to move in our lives or the life of someone we love. God, what we do today is we lay it at your feet. We will not abandon our post, God. Strengthen our faith. Give us the strength, boldness, and courage to be patient in the waiting. God, to totally submit to you, to trust that your perspective is so much greater that you sit with us in our pain, God, but that you also have a perfect plan that you will work out just at your appointed time and you will not delay. God, we thank you for the gift of Christ, your son, at just the perfect time when it couldn't delay, God. At just the right time, you intervene to change everything for us. Thank you for the love that he models for us. Help us to be patient, God. Though it linger, may we wait. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, we believe everybody has a next step. We'd love to talk with you there in the next steps room in the lobby. You can still sign up for Pack Away Hunger. Victory, we aren't, we don't just go to church. We are the church. Everywhere we go, have a wonderful week.